Today we're speaking with Jeff McElfresh. Welcome, Jeff, and thank you for taking the time out to participate. Before we get started, please introduce yourself and tell us more about your background. Sure, it's a pleasure being here with you today. Uh, so Jeff McElfresh, uh, today I am the Chief Operating Officer of AT&T. Um, I'm responsible for, as the title suggests, executing the strategy of the company with all of our operating units. And I've been practicing this, uh, working on this for 27 years with the company. I uh, grew up in uh, North Florida. Uh, went to school, uh, got my engineering degree, and uh, launched into my career with AT and T. Excellent, um, thank you for that introduction. Since the podcast is called the Stan Sigmund Leadership and Innovation Podcast, can you please tell us more about who Stan Sigmund was, and what would interest the listener about him? Oh man, how long of a uh, series do we have here <laughs> on this episode? Um, well, he uh, was an amazing human being, I think is probably the most foundational thing I could say of that man. Um, and I think the morals and the ethics of Stan Sigman are foundational to him building his leadership platform because you knew, you know, he was a tough guy, direct. He expected a lot of people. He spoke with extreme clarity. He always knew where you stood with Stan. But at the same token, um, he was a role model for doing things right. And you knew as you were part of a team that he led, um, he was willing to do any job he was asking others to do. His credibility um, was just very solid. And as such, he created this level of followership that I think is unparalleled. In fact, seeing how um, individuals would rally around a challenge and uh, strive to over-deliver, understands leadership as a true hallmark to him as an individual and his character. Um, and I think that he uh, was somebody who also uh, was very humble. Um, he wasn't the center of attention. He always put the customer first. And uh, he provided for the right kind of voice representing uh, the front line of our company uh, constantly on his mind as he made decisions and guided the team. And so in a interesting way, um, he was not only a role model as a business leader, but generally speaking as a human, mm -hmm. just a fantastic person. So I've, as I've spoken to others of your colleagues, that's a, that's a recurrent theme. Um, it doesn't. It never comes across as being um, cult of personality. Uh, in fact, the more I, I've even heard you, in fact, I'm grateful you're speaking at length now because you've been here on campus for a day and a half and uh, have been doing nothing but speaking, so I appreciate it. But it seems like Stan was um, somebody who had focus and brevity. And so it's interesting how there must be other things, and it sounds to me like it's character of example. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I think as, as well, though, you know the old adage, it, you know, sorry I'm late, it took me a while to write you this letter. Um, Stan, Stan had this uncanny ability, well, maybe curiosity, but ability to understand what made the business tick. Mm -hmm. And he always <laughs> was the participant in the meetings to ensure that we remained focused on what was most important. Mm-hmm. And so the brevity of his messaging wasn't because he didn't like to speak. It was the simplifying of a message to ensure that the entirety of the organization was aligned on really what is most important. Mm -hmm. And I think no matter what industry you're in, uh, no matter what level of leader you are, where you are in your career, it's a practice that's actually hard to do. Mm -hmm. And to see him do it under so many circumstances gave many of us a real teaching on you could learn a thing or two about leading a large organization in a complex industry, being very clear in the way you communicate, what the objectives are. Mm -hmm. And um, and for me, I just uh, it's, it's a hallmark of uh, Stan Sigmund. Mm -hmm. And I am not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still working on that. 
though that's the mastery path i think right knowing that you know there's still more to go it seems like maybe his um uh, stan's leadership um you said that people would want to perform for him to yeah. want to basically not fall out of favor seems like there might have been a scarcity of that you know the meaning that it's an oasis yeah i think it's it's less about fall out of favor I say that if you failed to deliver your responsibility as a member of a team that Stan led, yes, I, I, and I've experienced that. Um, so I'm talking from first person knowledge. Um, you felt like you disappointed an individual who um, is betting on you. Right. And, but maybe more importantly than that, the culture that Stan created among his teams worked in such a way um, that I wasn't just letting him down. I was letting the team right. down. Right. And I think this is a really important nuance because what Stan built, I have copied mm. as much as I can because it works. Mm -hmm. And copy is probably the wrong word. I, it, it's heavily influenced me and many other friends and uh, colleagues of Stan. And so when something works, you know, you put mm -hmm. it to work. Um, and the, the, the point is that business isn't just going to exist around one individual. Mm -hmm. And if you're working to create something that's going to be durable, that's going to outlast mm -hmm. you, you have to build a management team that creates the right kind of accountability, but culture mm -hmm. to cultivate a continuing of that long after you're gone. Right. That's real leadership. And um, the reason why I am here on campus mm -hmm. with you maybe is a little bit uh, selfish because I'm trying to figure out what is in the water here at this great <laughs> institution uh, because y'all you'll have a way of cultivating some of these great mm -hmm. leaders who know hard work, mm -hmm. they know determination, mm -hmm. but they also have figured out leadership. And, you know, as Stan was educated here, um, as, as we all know, I'm trying to figure out, you know, which water fountain down this That's hallway right. <laughs> here has got the magic juice in it. It's on the fourth floor. <laughs> fourth floor. Um, all right. I, I appreciate that. That's a really good segue. Um, you know, the podcast... Uh, is really also about these key concepts uh, that, you know, the key concept of the series is leadership and innovation. Mm -hmm. And you've shared this a bit already, but just to kind of bring it back to focus from your experience, why is leadership such an important component of innovation? Yeah, I think um, let's, let's take this in a few directions maybe because um, I believe this in my core we, we are in a business, all business um, is built to do something, some purpose. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, your, your business and the vision of it has to be defined. And that vision has to be a shared vision among all that are required to execute it. N no different than maybe a sports mm -hmm. metaphor mm -hmm. and a basketball team. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the, the concept of innovation sometimes I think gets um, a young, bright mind or a really skilled leader in a company thinking, well, I've got to talk about hyperscale. I've got to talk about 5G. I've got to talk about digital AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning. That's innovation. And really, innovation comes in many forms. Sure. And what Stan's culture that he established at the company was one in which the customer was at the center of all that we did. We knew that the customer was the boss. We are there to serve the customer, and our front line was there to serve our customer. And the kind of innovative things we accomplished under his leadership weren't just technology-based, in the evolution of wireless in this industry or device-based, mm -hmm. it was also operational right. in the way we changed the way we operated the company and remained vigilant on the things that mattered most. You don't get that kind of innovation unless you have a culture of transparency. 
where you are willing to take the time to listen to what the most important people in your company, the frontline professionals, are telling you mm -hmm. you need to change to do a better job on. And I think Stan wrote the master class in how to do this at scale. The kinds of innovation that um, I was part of and I learned from Stan, um, uh, I, I humbly believe was because the culture of our company was unified. We, mm -hmm. we shared this vision of being better than we were. In fact, mm -hmm. at that time, we were not the industry leader. I think our churn rate, the amount of time that customers fired us mm -hmm. as a percentage of your base, I think if my memory is correct, about two and a half percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, the industry leader was uh, 1.7 percent. I think that's going to be close enough for government work. Ergo, a country mile apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, none of us in the company looked at that and said, okay, we can accomplish that. We can overcome that gap because their competition is constantly getting better. But, you know, Stan was bold enough as a leader, you have to be bold at times mm -hmm. to set a brighter future, to see a brighter horizon and to challenge the organization to go achieve something mm -hmm. that you don't think you can achieve. And what you learn in the process as you listen to the things that matter most to customers is, well, there's the answer. I might need technology to solve the problem, but I'm not deploying technology for the sake of deploying tech. Right. I'm listening to what the fundamental of the business is and the leadership that's closest to the customer. And, um, and so off you go with a better strategy to improve the quality of the business and the caliber of the customer base. And that requires culture, and that comes from leadership. Right. One of the questions um, I've asked uh, pretty repeatedly of, of every guest, and it's really on the uh, topic of nature versus uh, nurture. Mm -hmm. The idea is, you know, uh, you were at an event today and some students had asked you some questions. And I think wherever you're at, and the answer, of course, is one foot at a time to some degree, but they want to know, well, how did you get there? And it, it, as educators, we're going to ask ourselves, well, what curriculum can we put together and all that? And there's certainly valid things to learn in the curriculum, but it feels like there's some nature-nurture balance. What do you think? Well, I think this has been a question debated by many. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a hundred books out there that declare they, they have the answer. And the truth is uh, leadership itself has got a really important word in it, leader. Mm -hmm. And that's an individual thing. Um, that is a, a personal component to it. And so number one, not everybody um, is going to follow the same rule set or textbook or process to develop their leadership skills. Mm -hmm. um, I, for one, believe it can be developed. I don't believe you're born with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm living proof I'm still working on it. And um, as I shared with the classroom just a short while ago, I think I've had to develop more leadership capability in the last three years of my career than I did in the prior 24. Right. Because opportunity itself presents the – time presents the opportunity mm -hmm. for me, the circumstances that I face now and the job that I do for our company – um, provides that canvas mm -hmm. to, to, to develop and expand. But there's, an there's like two ingredients, though, that I think are really important to leadership. And the first one is being curious. Yeah. Curiosity is this amazing adrenaline uh, for your brain. Um, curiosity in how a system works. Mm -hmm. Curiosity in how a business functions. Cur curiosity in how does your brain work? Right. How, how, do, how do people work? Mm -hmm. um, your curiosity could be in just about any discipline, but that curiosity is what drives your desire to learn more about a subject matter. And if you're not curious, it's going to be really hard to develop mastery or expert mm -hmm. skills uh, as a leader. You've mm -hmm. got to be open to learn. Right. 
and motivated to push yourself as uh, we once, uh, we, we often say, and I shared with the classroom, um, you know, amateurs practice until they get something right. Professionals practice until they fail. Uh, yep. And um, and so, you know, you kind of need that curiosity to keep you going because you're going to fail. Right. And in that failure, in that failure, you 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 learn. And of course, you need help along mm-hmm. the way. You need to be in a system, in a support model, uh, albeit a classroom mm-hmm. or in a professional setting in business and enterprise where the culture is okay for you to make a mistake mm-hmm. and to ensure that you have learned something from that that right. you can develop. So I, I, I believe um, curiosity is one core ingredient to leadership and nurturing it. The second one is uh, something that I've, I've learned along the way from a really important mentor, not just Dan, but Ralph De La Vega. Mm-hmm. And that is don't let anybody put limits on what you can achieve. You're the only one human as an individual that understands um, uh, what you're capable of doing. And there will be a lot of folks and a lot of systems and a lot of things that might suggest to you that you really don't have much of an option. But Mm -hmm. if you don't have a positive attitude Mm -hmm. um, and that lean into you and your growth, um, you're not going to reach your full potential. So don't let anybody limit what you can become. I think is like a second ingredient to the foundation. If you have those, um, you can absolutely develop leadership skills. Sure. I I had asked about nature and nurture, um, and a variation of that. You know, one of my next questions is somewhere along the lines of, um, you know, what will we say to students? But you've been spending an entire day on campus saying things to students. But the theme I'd actually spoken um, on with you previously before we um, started speaking on, you know, in recording, is what is the, what, what role do you think? So Stan was a mentor, and you had mentioned Ralph being a mentor. Um, and Stan, as you were describing to me earlier, made it clear what the parameters of performance were. Correct. So what is the, what is the mentoring role of failure? How do we... How do we in, live with and embrace failure? Because I can tell you today's student, I, and frankly, I don't know if today's student's any different, so i got to be careful here. Students, because they're at an earlier stage of development in life, have a difficult time with that. And basically the entire basis of the summative evaluation they get in K through 12 and beyond is largely that what didn't you do right type of thing. So it creates almost like penalty for failure. And, and of course, some failures yeah. do have penalty, but it ought to be one of your best teachers. Oh, it, it, it actually is the best teacher. There are a handful of things. Um, when the sun is shining, when the wind's at your back, uh, when it's downhill, um, man, you can run fast. Yeah, that's right. Um, and generally speaking, when everybody is winning and everything's going great, people tend to let their guard down. Mm-hmm. And they may think, see how good we are. Check, the, check us out. We're winning. It's only when you get hit with adversity, you're thrown into the deep end. There is no obvious answer. That's when the true character of an individual mm-hmm. or true character of a institution mm-hmm. or of society, that's, that's when it's really apparent. And, and so when you move forward, when you lean towards the bigger challenges, you realize that um, you got to try. Mm-hmm. You can't just let things happen. If you know that there is something that can be done, mm-hmm. you have to lean in and try and don't be afraid to fail. That's easy to say. Yeah. Um, and it takes a ton of support to, to do. Um, what I mean by support, I mean, if you're not going to take a risk, you're probably never going to be a professional Mm -hmm. because I'm pretty sure most of the most famous athletes um, that we could probably cite 
have been on the breaking point of their physical body mm -hmm. at some point during training. Mm -hmm. One extra rep and I might blow my knee out, but mm -hmm. they are pushing the limit. Um, the same is true in business or the same is true for students. If you're not willing to um, push yourself into a subject matter that's not natural for you because mm -hmm. you don't want to mess up your GPA, mm -hmm. yeah, it might be the most important subject matter that you didn't realize you needed to take mm -hmm. when you become what you will become in the future. Think, for example... Um, to make it a bit more personal, mm -hmm. I was given this opportunity at the university in North Florida where I started my, my career, my academic career. Um, I had to take a history class. And um, I'm not all that interested in history. Mm -hmm. At least at that age, I wasn't. Today, I'm fascinated by it. So I took this class on Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. And it was a class just about him. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, that'll be interesting. Well, what I learned in that class was um, a master class in logistics. Uh -huh. And um, for, for your student listeners um, who, who, who hear this, understand that by foot, his armies conquered a third of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, humans need food, water, yep. not just weapons to win uh, in conflict. And so the thought process of how you stage that kind of strategy, mm -hmm. um, I started to form some thinking just from that class. Now, I think I got a C in that class. It didn't help my GPA, but it piqued my curiosity about geography and what it takes to actually logistically plan right. something very large. And I found myself later in my career drawing on mm -hmm. those kind of lessons that you might learn. And so I think what Stan would say if he were here is the following. Um, I uh, want you to take a risk. Mm -hmm. I know you're not always going to be right, but I want those risks to be smart and calculated. And I want you to tell me what you are looking for in this risk to measure whether or not it was a success or a failure. Mm -hmm. And then whatever it is, you're going to tell me was it a success and why, or it was a failure and why? Right. And what have you learned from that? Um, that's kind of the r regime or the practice, the routine is the word I was looking for, mm -hmm. that I observed Stan do with all of us out in the field uh, operating the territories of his business. And uh, it helped all of us raise our hand to ask for help. Right. The culture was set up where it was competitive, but we all knew that we were all on the home team mm -hmm. and uh, we could learn from one another. If a partner made a risk that worked, I could copy that. If they made a risk uh, move that failed, I could learn from that. That's the power of the teamwork and the culture that Stan engendered in the company. And so then you're taking risks, but you're not taking it alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that gave us a lot of confidence to push the envelope on many maneuvers. Good. The genesis of um, the series, right? So we, uh, this year we stood up a podcast. Uh, the motivation was, well, could we have more thought um, and really exploration of the themes of the series, um, you know, in the interim, right? Because we have the, the on-campus part, which right. we're grateful for you to participate in this year, uh, in the fall. Uh, when the series got... Um, got off the ground, which was, I mean, we had our first last year with Ralph De La Vega. Uh, we had, um, not the we, the friends of um, Stan Sigmund had uh, put their heads together, and I, you know all of them, and said, well, let's explore some of the values and principles that we could remember um, Stan being emblemic of, right? Him just uh, in the leadership and mentorship. And, and what I've seen across the board and heard across the board is a real genuine fondness. And that, that's, it's almost impossible to be contrived. You know, it's, it's, it's extremely genuine. And so I'm going to go ahead and read them off. I mean, I've, I've, it's not the first episode I've done so, but it's, it's a good springboard for, to take our discussion to a next stage. So they uh, read out as authenticity, integrity, accountability, teamwork, execution, people, communication, 
empathy, respect, and vision. And speaking of vision, what I had envisioned is actually to try to um, see if you could go at the other end of the spectrum, because I haven't had any takers on it yet, but it seems to be very poignant for the whole backstory, um, your backstory, Stan's backstory, the backstories I've been hearing since I've been involved with this. And that is vision. Yes, vision. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, right? I think yeah. a lot of... Um, a lot of folks probably look back and say, man, check out that success that the organization had or that company had. Man, that CEO, founder, man, they had a vision, right? Right. You hear a lot about the, the successes. Yeah. Very rarely do you hear about the failures mm -hmm. that, it, that you had to stumble through to, to get to where you were on that. And uh, for, for Stan, being a very brief communicator... Um, also uh, an individual who had a ton of courage and understood how the fundamentals of business really worked and where the value lied. Um, it was pretty clear to anybody that worked with Stan that as a leader, you have got to create a brighter vision of the future, a positive horizon, mm -hmm. something that is um, inspiring, achievable, just out of, re just out of reach. Um, because if the goal or the bar is set too low, it's not really sure. a vision, right? Yeah. You, you really, if you're going to uh, encourage risk-taking and intelligent risk-taking, you've got to push the envelope because you know mm -hmm. and Stan knew because he had grown up in the company from the most basic entry-level right. job all the way through the history of it. So he knew we were better. Uh, we could be better than we were. And so he he always had a saying, you know, vision, um, you can define it however you want it, but you better, it better be industry leadership. Mm -hmm. It better be something that is measurable, that uh, your share owners, your customers, and your employees can... Um, can orient themselves to and measure. You either are or you're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, industry leadership can be defined in a magnitude of ways, mm -hmm. and you kind of you kind of got to think about the history of the company. And when I when I first came to work with Stan uh, in his organization, uh, we were at a point in time where our company wasn't really doing that well. We had struggled with, uh, I think, a clear vision. We were not a na nationwide wireless network. Um, we were strong on the coasts. We gapped a lot of coverage in uh, more rural parts of uh, the square states. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and we, uh, we were on the brink of um, putting together another wireless company back then known as AT&T Wireless and merging the two to become a real national force to compete head to head with the arch rival who was the industry leader back in time. And as I shared earlier today uh, with many of the students, uh, for those of us that had been working in the company, struggling to put any kind of growth on the board in the quarter to have a leader declare, we are going to change. Uh, we are going to achieve national scale uh, we are going to innovate or change the way we operate this business. We're going to get the decision-making down as close to the customer as possible, and we are going to be an industry leader. Mm -hmm. And defining what that looked like in the steps that we needed to take um, was a very critical, pivotal moment in the history of AT&T. Mm -hmm. Today we sit here with a very robust and strong wireless industry in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that we have to think Stan for. As the uh, somewhat of an architect, an operator, a builder of companies all along the way, um, what started out as a very local, regional type operation, we, we quickly found our way into that national footprint into an operating structure that placed the accountability um, out at the line. Um, in fact, Stan had this phrase, I'm just reminded of it, line led staff. Hmm. And what that meant 
was as we all shared in this vision of a brighter future and being an industry leader, and this is all before iPhone and mm -hmm, all of mm -hmm. that amazing innovation, um, you know, he recognized that the operating model and the culture of the company needed to be reset in order for us to achieve our full potential. And so he set that system up mm -hmm. with the 27 local market VPGMs and his 4R methodology. And then he made it very well known that those 27 leaders out in the field run the company. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, like they are the line, everybody else up the chain of command, so to speak, um, you are there to do what is needed to support those frontline field generals so that they can execute what needs to be executed there in here in Amarillo. Right. And that might be a little different than what we might do in San Antonio, a little different than what might be needed in Los Angeles. And that, that accountability out, out into the field was simply huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've shared with many of your students, I have employed that exact strategy um, no matter what the industry is that I uh, found myself, be it wireless or uh, the pay TV satellite business, whether it's here in the U.S., if it's in South America and the likes of Argentina or Brazil or Chile, um, the system works. Mm -hmm. The vision becomes shared. Um, you start putting points on the board. Attitudes start to shift. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, there's this can-do spirit that just happens mm -hmm. and we're unstoppable. And that is a competitive advantage. Right. And as a result, um, you do find the path to achieve industry leadership, however you have defined it for your next chapter of your company. Right. It's a very human process. If, if I'm listening, trying to um, uh, synthesize some of how you've shared it, and it's been fascinating for me uh, hosting these podcasts to listen to each guest share the same phenomenon or at least a reasonably similar phenomenon in different ways. I hear uh, the curiosity was really important mm -hmm. because, um, but the other one I hear is a boldness, but the boldness is, it sounds to me like the vision is we're going to go there. Well, where's there? I don't know, but we're going to go there. And I'm pretty uh. certain that, you know, you're, you're welcome to be on board. Let's go. People, humans seem to like that because this seems to have transcended uh, you had a well, good way of putting it, but you would listed the number of countries, the number of cultures, the number of languages, sure. and then and, and that's a gift. I mean, I'm sure you're extremely more enriched and actually have a much greater degree of faith in this rubric, in this, in this, uh, you know. That's um, a beautiful way of putting you know, it. Yeah. Um, it. The analogy I would use is, let's say, Dr. Bab, you and I were thinking, let's go to Seattle. Mm -hmm. Some some students may say, okay, well, how are we going to get there? Mm -hmm. Uh, what's our route? Where are we going to stop for food and fuel? Um, and now I would say, well, we know it's north, northwest from here. So let's get going. Yeah, let's head that way. Let's head that way. Right. Because there is plenty of time mm. between now and when we arrive mm. to account for the unknowns mm. that might get thrown in the face of your strategy, like snow, can't do mountain passes, sure. weather, uh, accidents, uh, the vehicle that we're in is not as efficient as we thought it was. And so this agile method of having a strategy and an operating system in your company as you're executing, executing it to be very adaptive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to real time, real world data yep. with decision makers who are equipped to respond it makes a very large company feel very small and agile yeah. there in the local market. Right. That is uncomfortable because everybody wants the full answer. Mm -hmm. And well, 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 what if Seattle is not the right destination? Okay, well, we don't have a shared vision then. If you don't agree, we need to head off to Seattle. Yeah. So I still have work to do to help bring you sure. to the same level of understanding yeah. of what we're doing in the company. And, um, and that's kind of more akin to the way I would describe our culture back then mm -hmm. in these days. Uh, we didn't have to have the answers to everything. Right. We, we just needed to know that's the direction. We know we're not number one. Mm -hmm. We're going to go stretch ourselves to do as best as we can to close that gap mm -hmm. as fast we can 
but we're going to have to react to what sure. happens in the industry. seems like sometimes the leadership is also, so let's say you get to Seattle and we say, ah, we got here and it's probably really Vancouver. So it's also that uh, the ability to pivot. Because the uh, the most poignant story, I think that the public would know, and you know they they everybody knows who AT and T is, but um, students in particular, even though he's an alum, you know if they were born after a certain time, they're to be forgiven. But it's the story that joins you and stand together is fascinating, and I think it's a study in this. And the study is, we want to go there, and. Nobody thinks that going there means anything. In fact, the words you use was that's the science experiment. So the there and the you know the 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 hit and the set list, if you will, is um, the vision to turn wireless into what to enable the world that we live in today that required vision and commitment to go to a place we weren't at. And I don't think anybody can imagine not being where we are now. Yeah. I, I couldn't. Yeah. Um, I think I challenge the audience if they they think they can survive and mm -hmm. put their smartphone on airplane mode for a week. Mm -hmm. Call me and tell me how that felt. Yeah, um, that's part of what we at AT and T are working hard to overcome those that don't have access to high speed internet, right. um, wired or wireless. Um, that's what's been coined now as the digital divide. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, when Stan started in the wireless industry, uh, it was before me. Uh, I joined his, um, you know, his train, if you will, mm -hmm. um, at a certain G. And the wireless industry can be defined in G. Right. There was one G right. back in the day um, that made its way to 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. And it's interesting because the United States, um, and this is very rarely spoken about, I think, but the United States had its own technology path right. uh, for wireless. Um, the world was on a path known as GSM. Mm -hmm. The U.S. was on this path known as CDMA from one player, TDMA mm -hmm. from, from, from us and a few others. So we weren't really part of a global standard, yet the technology that we were deploying was, in, in fact, scaled and durable. TDMA is the 2G era, not quite 3G. And uh, we, were, we were left with a decision. We either A, heads down and stay the course on the technology of TDMA, or we migrate to GSM. Mm -hmm. And a few of your podcasters uh, who are amazing people, um, I think, could probably tell this story a lot better than me. But the thought that you are going to make a flagship tech change in a network that already has customers paying you to use the service mm -hmm. from TDMA to GSM requires some pretty unproven technology that you're the only company in the world that needs it. Right. It's not like this problem is trying to get solved in some other nation. And so the technology teams, the marketing teams had to figure how I can have a TDMA and a GSM network all in the same network and build a handset that could talk to both sides of that network as uh, the singular uh, network team made the transition mm -hmm. to get us to a global standard. So that was a huge, huge risk, huge risk that worked out. Right. And I already shared earlier, now we weren't a national footprint. You've got to have scale. You've got to be able to serve all of your customers in all markets. And so the merger with AT&T Wireless gave us that almost national footprint and really strengthened the company. And I, I shared with your students earlier that I actually thought we were going to lose market share when we came out of the block. And my analytics and my model did not have this X factor of mm -hmm. execution, kind of the stand fingerprints. Right. And, um, you know, we came out of the block in the first quarter as a new company and we led the industry in growth. And that wasn't because the math said we should. It was because of the followership and the shared vision right. and the commitment right. 
of the organization to go be better than we were. And, um, and that is a strategic uh, weapon that uh, companies, I think, undervalue at times. Right, right. It's such critical infrastructure now. When we were speaking um, with you ahead of time and, and some of the people on your staff at a time, they had mentioned that you had been recently busy um, with Hurricane Ian. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just such a poignant reminder. It's a lifeline that nobody could imagine quite this way. And that was vision. And this is a, real people that we're discussing right now. It's not abstract. This is real. Oh, it, it absolutely is real. And, you know, it's amazing what leaders, uh, leaders have to walk the talk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Leaders have to live their values and stand, and in many cases, um, and I have so many that I could use um, as examples of how he led from the front, mm -hmm. whether it was a good time or a bad time, was willing to um, do his part as a leader of this great company. And um, I remember Katrina and Stan's uh, immediate move to get to the impacted area in Katrina, because mm -hmm. that was, um, those, those were sad days right. uh, yes. for a lot of folks. And Stan's first question wasn't about the network. It wasn't about um, devices. It was about our people. Right wanting to make certain that uh, our, our people were safe because if we don't have our people, we can't serve our customers. Right. And, um, and that wasn't just because of a disaster. Uh, I can remember three weeks on the job, promoted to a, uh, being a vice president out in Arizona. Um, three weeks on the job, you get a phone call. Stan on the other end of the line. Now, to put into perspective for your students and your listeners, there might have been one, two, three, four, four levels of management between me at the time and where Stan was in the company. And his first question would be basically something like, you know, you got it fixed yet? You know, because let's go, got to execute, let's sure, go. Sure. Um, but he would very quickly pivot to the people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tell me about your team, mm -hmm. who you like, who's working out. Right. Who's going to make it? Right. Who do you need to change? Right. And that instilled in all of us that were part of that system uh, the importance of building a very healthy team. And if you've got a strong team, then you can uh, give them the responsibility to make very tough decisions. You don't have to make all those back at headquarters. Mm -hmm. And that played out very well. Um, I can see that now today and most recently Hurricane Ian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the opportunity to visit with a lot of our front line responsible for that network in that part of Florida. And to hear the things that they have been able to do without the headquarters building being engaged in a response or a disaster recovery investment um, just gives me personally a lot of pride and how we as a company are on this most important infrastructure that the entire country is in need of. What we do really does matter. Yes. It is not just a tech platform. That's correct. This connects yeah. people to greater possibilities. Yeah. And when the connection isn't there, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's missed. It is an impact to... Mm -hmm. Um, not only that community and the economy, but to individuals who don't have the ability to communicate. And, and so there's a genuine spirit to serve that exists inside of the at and tiers. Yeah. And um, Stan walked that talk and lived that by example. And um, he's once, like I said earlier, is a great human, yeah. great role model. Right. And we're all trying to live up to his standard. I'll bring it up to kind of send us out of this episode. I'll bring it kind of full circle. So you're here um, visiting um, Stan's alma mater. And I certainly um, am biased. I have a, a, a personally, but also um, um, in, with respect to my own ethos and investment in education. Um, I'm still a believer in it. One of the doors that the innovation that AT&T has participated in is the availability of information, you know, the 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 fluidity of knowledge, the fluidity of, of experience. And so it really raises interesting questions about, well, 
you know, how do people need to be educated? Do they need to be educated? Do they need to be educated here, you know, in, in the hallowed halls of higher education? And it really does pr promote probably really healthy reflections on what is the value of education? Is it to, as I sometimes joke, to pry open the cranium and pour all the stuff in? Um, you know, or is it a developmental process? So particularly because you have a, a very significant role in your organization. And so you know what is necessary in human resources. What is your take? This is, you know, late 2022. What is your take on the value of education? And, and I'll be more specific, higher education. No, I, I think... If we uh, take our eye off of that, um, the next generation in our country is going to regret it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the role of education, uh, no matter if it's K through 12 sure. um, or even higher education, um, is is an area where we all need to contribute a bit more energy, in my opinion. Um, the technology as you bring it, you know, when I was going to college or in high school, I couldn't ask Google what the answer mm -hmm. to the equation was. And now that is an actually dependable way to learn yeah. and, um, you know, or YouTube, how to go fix a bearing on a tractor wheel, you know, chances are uh, there's somebody out there that has uh, shot the video of that. So the internet and the access to it is an amazing tool. Yes. What's not so amazing or what it has created is this lack of patience mm -hmm. to get to an answer. Um, and I think the role of education has to be almost to slow the yeah. student or the subject down yeah. just a moment because it's the process of problem solving, the process of learning that has become hard to defend. Right. Um, I was sharing at lunch, uh, my son over the pandemic, uh, was finishing up his high school and, um, he got into the Robin hood mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, uh, buying stocks yeah. and, you know, for him owning a stock or buying a stock $5 or $10 mm -hmm. is because he wants to buy it and then sell it mm -hmm. in five days not, or 10 days, not think about an investment for the future, for a rainy day fund sure. or for retirement. And, and I think, um, with this technology, we have the responsibility as the generation ahead right. to use it appropriately and find creative, innovative ways so that we can show the younger bright minds mm -hmm. why the process of experimenting and failing that learning process is actually the magic yeah. that education is teaching. Right. It's not the subject matter. Sure. It's yeah. the process of learning. Mm -hmm. It's the discipline in trying to learn something that you think you know, but you don't know. Right. And um, I think our enemy on that is patience. Sure. And that's a, the focal point. So the what you're learning is a focal point to apply yourself and to fail within it. I was just saying um, very recently, some other colleagues here in the college that I think we could probably get the slickest possible actor and graphics and all that to give the subject matter through in a way that I probably never can compete with. But to be able to mentor somebody, and that's the full circle because Stan mm -hmm. was inspirational to you and all of your colleagues from that mentoring, and that's interactive and that's developed over time and then it's developed from the challenge. You know, you said that you've learned more in the last three years. Correct. Well, the, the scope of exposure is greater, right? Correct. And you had to level up into that. You didn't pop into that yesterday, so. Correct, and this concept mm -hmm. of being able to be anywhere at any time digitally, yeah. right, has really been a beautiful opportunity um, door for educators. It's also been a challenge, mm -hmm. right? But the pandemic, changed the workplace, yeah. it, it changed the classroom, yeah. it's changed the way we engage one another. And mm -hmm. I think that's, we gotta, we gotta pay very close attention to that. Right. Because isolation is needed at some points in the learning process or in life, but probably shouldn't dominate mm -hmm. the time. And getting people together under one roof at a certain moment in time to tackle a particular challenge, there are intangibles that mm -hmm. happen. You know, lessons aren't taught only by the professor. Yeah. They're, they're I, learned I to, by one another. I have to imagine this evolutionary too. I mean, we're probably as creatures disposed to that. 
Right. Uh, well, Jeff, um, I know you got to get going. I really appreciate you being here. So thanks for giving us another wonderful episode of the podcast. Um, any last words, anything going on in your life that's interesting, anything coming up? And it's usually I'd like to give the guest the last word. Yeah, I appreciate that here on this episode, the Jeff and Jeff episode. There you go. That's correct. Uh, I had to call Jeff's that word. out. <laughs> um, no, one message to any student that's listening. And that is this. You are sitting right here at the place that Stan Sigmund once walked these halls, never knowing one day what he would accomplish in his life. He himself unknowingly has worked to develop a technology and make available to all of you technology that connects you to the world, which means your opportunity is a much larger opportunity set than he ever faced. Right. So my challenge to all the buffaloes is don't let anybody put limitations on what you can accomplish and seize the moment right now with the gifts that Stan has given all of us to better yourself and expand your horizon. Be curious and go get it. Outstanding. Thanks for being here, Jeff.